Hi, everyone in North America and around the world. We broke through 166,000 subscribers since last week. So please keep helping this Earth Files YouTube broadcast to keep growing. And we'll have a spring equinox celebration on the March 24th show with or without these furry babies. I got Fluffy uh, right now and Chocolate is probably waiting to jump up so his tail will get in the screen tonight like he did uh, last week, I think, and the week before. You've been sending me a lot of email and proton mail about my interview one month ago on February 10th. It was with retired attorney and UFO abductee Terry Lovelace. One recent email came from Ron Holland, who back in the 1960s had a top secret clearance working for the NSA and who I interviewed in September of 2020 about his firsthand experience during the first moon landing of Apollo 11 in July 1969. And that's when Ron Holland worked for NASA in spacecraft operations and communications. The Apollo 11 moon landing transmission was on a 10 second delay. Ron Holland heard with his own ears astronaut Neil Armstrong say, quote, they are watching us from the crater, close quote. The they was later whispered to be three large extraterrestrial silver disks hovering above a crater rim. Ron Holland told me that he suspected NASA cut over to the medical channel, which was private between the astronauts and Houston. And that's a quote from him. Ron Holland also saw airbrush photographs on the backside of our moon, where he knew for a fact NASA and NSA had photographs of, quote, a structure that had a lot of 90 degree right angles to it and was rather tall, close quote. And after seeing these backside moon images from my recent February 10th interview with Terry Lovelace, Ron Holland sent me this email. This is how I just finished watching your Terry Lovelace podcast. And I'm happy to say the information about bases and buildings on the moon's far side further confirmed my own experience with the photo I was shown and what I heard in my NSA security work at NASA Goddard so many years ago. What I glean from your interview with Mr. Lovelace about his ET friend is that just maybe it is time for us folks who possess direct and incredible ET experience, we should begin to speak without fear of ridicule about our experiences in some public way. Please don't ever give up your important work, R. Ron Holland. I agree with Ron Holland, and I say to whistleblowers everywhere who have firsthand knowledge about the truth of alien presences on Earth, the moon, throughout this solar system and beyond, I honor all requests for anonymity and encourage those of you with solid firsthand knowledge to reach out to me in Proton Mail, Hard Mail, or FedEx. And since my February 10th interview last month with retired attorney Terry Lovelace, a lot of you have written wanting to know more about the hybrid and cloning operations that Terry saw with his own eyes as he passed hundreds of what looked like fish tanks filled with pinkish liquid in which there were different stages of developing fetuses and other unidentified life forms. All of that, Terry links to being inside this gigantic triangular UFO that abducted him and his friend Toby from Devil's Den, Arkansas, 44 years ago during a 1977 camping trip. Terry vividly remembers the huge corridor. They were moved down past not only the many tanks of developing fetuses, but disc-shaped UFOs and small car-like machines off to their far right as he drew them here. 
Terry thinks that the gray beings, including this Asian-looking female that he calls Betty, keep track of him at all times and sometimes communicate to let him know they are around and even provoke him from sound sleep to get up and take photos of the night sky, leaving Terry shocked when he sees photographic evidence on his own cell phone. Here is one of those sleep photos that Terry took in a burst of 23 frames on his iPhone 6. The date was June 3rd, 2019, at 2.35 a.m. Central, after Terry was abruptly pulled from sleep out onto his front yard in his bare feet to photograph the sky without knowing why. That series of frames was taken on June 3rd of 2019 at about 2.35 a.m. I woke up probably right about 2.30 on the nose, and I felt compelled to go outside and take a photograph. That's happened to me a couple of times in my life. And I followed the compulsion. I went out to the front yard, and the moon was right above me, and I took one photograph. And the iPhone 6 that I use, with one click set properly, it'll take a series of frames, like a mini video. Mm -hmm. And that's the setting that I had on it. And that explains the 23 frames that make up this moving GIF. Yes. If you have gotten out of bed and you've gotten your I-6 and you've gone outside and you're out in the front yard, are you totally in beta consciousness or are you in another state? I'm in another state. I went outside in my bare feet in my underwear. And I know that's the truth because when I woke up the next morning at my usual time, I felt fine. I didn't feel any after effects. I did not immediately remember going outside at 2.35 a.m., but there were grass clippings from my feet on the floor and in the bed. And as soon as I saw that, then I remembered what I did. I grabbed my phone, and that's when I saw the image. And what was your first reaction looking at it? I think what I saw and what is pictured there is some type of craft. Now explain which part of the frame you are looking at and what you think is a UFO craft. The fireworks effect to the left of the moon, that's what I felt strongest about. I know that's not an aircraft. I know what aircraft in the sky look like. There's no green or red light. Mm -hmm. It's a single white light. It's moving fast. What do you think that the Betty-type gray aliens, if that's who was inspiring you to get out of bed, what do you think that they were trying to communicate to you on June 3rd, 2019, what is it that they want you to see and understand? Their presence. They wanted me to know that they were still there. We had moved. We had only been in this house a matter of a week or two. I interpreted that as a clear message that we're here. We know where you moved. (laughs) That's right. I want to read what a professional image analyzer said. Quote, Technically, this isn't a video, but a burst of 23 still frames. You can see the effect of the flash on the surrounding environment. The dancing light below and to the right of the moon is a typical lens flare that dances around due to slight vibrations of the handheld camera. At first, the sparkling lights between the tree limbs seemed indistinguishable from an airliner that has a fixed center light and flashing strobes on its wingtips. But starting at frame 16, the flashing stops, and we see only the fixed light. At the same time, a second light appears, following behind the first one on a roughly similar trajectory, and the first one seems to disappear. I've examined these frames as closely as possible, and I cannot tell whether something anomalous is going on or whether these are two airplanes on slightly different courses appearing through a hole in the clouds and then being obscured again by the clouds and or the tip of the tree branches. If this had been a real video and gone on for longer, we would probably have an answer but I'm afraid this is the best I can do with this sequence of images. So he doesn't outright dismiss it. 
I think that your speculation about it being an effort on the part of the Betty Gray type to let you know they're still there, they know when you move, they know everything about you. This is one of the gray beings that has been in Terry Lovelace's whole life since he was a young child. When he was little, he knew her as Sue, but he did not see her as non-human then. And now, today, he sees her as Betty. Betty has not tried to hide from Terry that a major goal of her gray type species is to hybridize with Earth's homo sapiens sapien humans. But Terry has never gotten a clear, straightforward answer about why. After his most recent second book, Devil's Den, The Reckoning, came out earlier this year, Terry wanted to learn what other humans have been experiencing in recent missing time abductions. And here is what he has been learning. In the back of my book, I gave an email address. and says, I'm not a counselor or a doctor. But if you've got an experience you'd like to share, I'd love to hear it. Well, I've got over 1,600 emails. And what are people telling you and asking you? Here's the number one overriding thing. Women are telling me that they are pregnant. They're in their ninth, tenth week of pregnancy. They wake up one morning. They're no longer pregnant. They feel an overriding sense of sadness. They go to the hospital. They're examined. There's no evidence of blood or tissue. They don't recall passing anything. No blood in the toilet. And they have an examination. There's no evidence they were ever pregnant. One woman that contacted me told me that her husband took her to the emergency room because she was so frantic. And when she got to the emergency room, the OBGYN doctor on call personally knew her OBGYN physician and called her. And the two had a conversation. And her doctor told this emergency room doctor, yes, she was just in my office three weeks ago for a well check, and she's absolutely pregnant. But there was no need for a DNC, no need for any medical intervention of any kind. They just sent her home. And she's not the only one. And I had a man. I had a man right from Alabama who told me that he was asleep on the front porch of his house on a porch swing. It's a hot night. He's a very religious man. He was out there trying to get a good night's sleep, and this thing, like an egg, large egg-shaped craft, landed in his front yard, and a two-foot-tall gray being walked up to him and said, follow me, and he did, and he went inside the ship, and he was ordered by this little man to disrobe, and he did, without question, and he sat on this white exam table, and the little guy sprayed him down with some kind of fluid from a canister he had underneath his arm. And then a female being walked into the room that looked human, although he said that he doesn't think she was human. For one thing, she never opened her mouth, never spoke. They had intercourse. But he said that she looked almost plastic, and that there was not a hair or a mole or a scar or anything on her skin. It was just solid flesh tone. And he claims that little man put him back on the porch swing, and he was out. He woke up the next morning and thought it was a dream. And then a year later, almost to the day, he is taken again. And this time, he's taken from his bed and taken out of the house and back into the craft and presented with an infant in swaddling cloth by a gray who told him that the baby needs to smell him, that he needs to touch the baby, that they need to make Flash. contact. He told me that his first concern was she was so tiny that was she okay? And the, telepathically, the gray assured him, yes, the baby's very healthy. And he said that he looked into her eyes, and he said she had the most beautiful black eyes. And he knew that this was his child. So I think they're absolutely using us for that purpose. Did this man have any telepathic communication showing him in pictures or telepathic thought why they were hybridizing between them and humans and creating hybrid children. I asked him that exact question. I said, toward what end is this happening? And he said that they evaded the question. They said, your infant child is fine. She'll grow up and have a healthy, happy life. And maybe someday you'll get to see her again. They assured him that he had nothing to worry about, and they thanked him. 
I don't know why they couldn't have done that in vitro. It seems odd to me that in vitro fertilization is such an easy thing to do. I mean, we do it, but they did it that way. Okay, that goes to what some people in the human abduction syndrome, going back to the 70s, the 80s, became aware that there is something about the genetic hybridization program that the greys are working on that they have discovered that they need something about the act of intercourse itself to make the pregnancy more viable. Well, this gentleman was very clear about that. He said that there had to be some type of elevated level of intimacy. That's why it was so important that this child smell him and feel his touch and know him, that that was somehow crucial to the child's development. I wonder if it has something to do with the evolutionary energy and force of the soul. That's a good question. Why the motive for making hybrids of Homo sapiens sapien on Earth? Isn't that the million-dollar question? I mean, isn't that what we want to know? Yeah. I want to know why. And, you know, when I meditate on that, my mind tends to gravitate toward some aspect of artificial intelligence, and I don't know why. I think that AI is involved at some level. I don't know where, I don't know what, but AI is involved. Who is it that they work for? Who is the progenitor race behind everything that the greys do in this particular universe? There has to be something else beyond the greys. And that same progenitor was probably the genesis of the human race. I mean, we came from somewhere. Something made us sentient. Something made us special. There's something unique about human beings that draws the attention of E.T. We are just awakening to this stuff. Right. I mean, there's a shift in our consciousness going on right now. A lot of people wrote to me and said, you know, I had never given this much thought, but after I read your book, it jogged something in my memory, and then they tell me about some experience that they had. And you know what's very common is? I probably have had 200 people write to me and say, you know, I had the most curious dream when I was age four or age five, and it's the most vivid dream I ever had, and I can recall it in great detail. But they say, isn't it odd that I can't remember the birthday parties, the Christmas mornings, the family vacations, but I can remember the dream from age four or five. That happens to a lot of people, and I, I don't think it's a dream. I think it's some kind of early contact. In 1995, I met another abductee who was also doing straightforward conscious communication with beings, first greys and then sometimes the reptilians. And his name is Jim Sparks. None of us know exactly what's happened. But in my uh, third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, I have a large chapter that I did together with Jim Sparks. And I wanted to just share as a compliment to Terry Lovelace, uh, who Betty has been straightforward about saying that they want to hybridize with Homo sapien sapien, but why? In this book, in a recorded discussion that I transcribed with Jim Sparks back in the early 90s or mid 90s, um, he said that he knew that the agenda of the gray beings was here to do a lot of cloning and hybridizing. And at one point, uh, he said that he had discussed the possibility, even with somebody who had apparently been in the government and he had gotten a telepathic download during one of his abductions in which he was seeing scenes as if he had been on this life before and part of the chapter is about his seeing other lives as related to a chain of lives that humans would go through in reincarnation, all having to do with this huge uh, cosmic fabric that we are involved with, 
the greys are involved with, the other intelligences are all involved with, but where is it headed? And Jim said that sometimes he thought that what they were trying to explain to him is that genetic memory of all the experiences of any given soul consciousness at any given life might be equivalent to producing library books that keep increasing their information and expanding pages with each generation. With their, the alien advanced technologies, the alien beings could play back human lives the way we check out books and CD-ROMs out of libraries for entertainment and for education. Perhaps information from both genes and souls. And I share this with you only as a footnote to the discussion tonight with Terry Lovelace because there has been a lot of, in many ways, deep and intimate communication between some humans and especially the gray beings. And everybody comes away with the same feeling that they made us. Jim Sparks, one of his first sentences was, yeah, the, the grays are responsible for the genetic manipulation in the already evolving primates of this planet, and they created us. But why would they be trying to hybridize with us now in the 20th and the 21st centuries? And the fact that Terry Lovelace doesn't have a clear perspective from Betty, who admits that's what they're doing, and Jim was as frustrated as Terry and others about what is exactly the reasons, what is the biggest picture, that to me is one of the reasons to keep on going, to keep doing this work, trying to help you all and myself to understand what are we in the middle of? What is the end game of all of this genetic manipulation on this planet and beyond? And hopefully we're going to get more answers this year and next year, I hope. But in the meantime, I recommend that for those of you who would like to do a deep dive, this third book of mine, Glimpses of Other Realities, goes not only into Jim Sparks, but has an entire huge section of military voices that because I know what's behind those military voices in this book, I can say if you really read every single word, you will come out the other side with a oh my God feeling. And with that, dear Ian, I'm very uh, curious about comments and questions tonight. Good evening, Linda. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the people who've uh, contributed to the Super Chats again this evening. We've got Cat Chaser, Moonbird, Carl Bittner, Sexy Sadie, TNC, JMDE8, BB, Sonia Rajwans, Dave Goodridge, Nathan C. And there's probably quite a few more because I was quite distracted by the video tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, listen, you guys, thank you. Thank you so much. It helps to keep all of this going. And I am so appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. And all of your wonderful, wonderful names. And Ian, thank you for being uh, so distracted by the video. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's a fascinating story and it just goes on and on. And a lot of the audience are uh, captivated too and there are a few experiences talking as well in the chat tonight so they resonate yeah. too with what terry has experienced and what uh, the people contacting terry have experienced too as well good well let's uh, okay. dive off with questions okay well here's one question uh, that relates to what the alien agenda is is there something to do with the soul being converted or transferred to an artificial intelligence that is perhaps created by the greys? That is definitely a question that does keep coming up. 
Could it be that if we knew the whole big picture of not just the 20th and the 21st century, but a much bigger picture, and you go back like Michio Kaku to the beginning or what seems to be the beginning cycle of the generation of this universe, and you come up to 13.8 billion where we are now, nearly 14 billion, and you divide, let's say, by four, then you would have something like three, close to three and a half billion years for four epochs. And that it is very possible that there are advanced civilizations that grew up, let's say, in era two to three, and we are young in the three to four, and that what an advanced civilization that can move space, not, po not the way we get in a rocket and go, but they move space, so they're moving point to point, that they can have portals in various dimensions and timelines and matter worlds, that the whole context for what would be a high priority for them would be so different for us and what we would be trying to understand about what is happening. Now, I realize that in this 180-day countdown to June 24th, no matter what the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence says this year in response to the request in the COVID funding bill, those words, advanced aerial threat and foreign adversaries are in those two pages related to a congressional request for information about UFOs slash UAPs unidentified aerial phenomena. And the emphasis on threat, a foreign adversary is a threat. It's just nicer sounding words. I've had information in the last year or so, in sometimes contradictory, but there definitely is a theme. It's like a note that keeps running through everything coming to me. Linda, there is a threat. Don't underestimate, there is a threat. Thanks, Chocolate. You came just right at the right time when we need love and peace. Thank you. But talking about the threat, it's not identified for me. But when you consider what we have before us in our own solar system, the possibility that there were two hydrogen bomb explosions in the northern hemisphere of Mars, maybe 300 million years ago, or 100 million years ago, or half a billion years ago. And that's John Brandenburg's work on Xenon-129 and Plutonium-244. So if Mars were attacked, if the Trinitite on our own planet is an indication that something that would be in some kind of a nuclear warfare also took place here. It means that our having what we think of as tendencies toward tribalism and violence didn't originate with this baby civilization of Homo sapiens sapien. It had been in this solar system in this Milky Way, in this universe for a long time. And all of that is to lead up to the way I think of things on chessboards and landscapes. If, if there are major wars that go on in ways that we cannot comprehend, but that the players in those wars or chess games need camouflage, but they need it of a very sophisticated nature because they can neutralize gravity, totally high-end use of invisibility. So many technologies, 
but maybe the one thing that gets them political territory, helps them defeat a foreign adversary, would be the ability to move in and out of inorganic and organic bodies. So part of what could be happening is that not only could there still be struggles over resources, and the resources are a wide shaping bell curve of many things, but it might be that the state of advanced technologies that are largely artificial intelligence, like the greys, as I've been told, that the way they compete, that the way they take on a foreign adversary could be from the inside out, meaning not bombs from out here, but finding a way to enter into the civilization that you want or the planet that you want or the moon that you want and work from the inside out. And if that were the big picture, then being able to genetically hybridize with a species that they wanted certain characteristics because they want that planet, that might be one of the approaches that is considered a threat. Another is that maybe the gray AI and whoever its progenitors are have reached a point where they need some way to rejuvenate whatever they are. And maybe this universe has a characteristic that some other universes might not have, and it could be that this whole universe is an experiment in organic life in which souls are embedded. And that is a big story. I'm not going to go into it tonight. But all of this is, if you read my work, you read other people's work who have interviewed people who are whistleblowers and lots and lots of abductees, you come to this kind of threshold where if you're going to step across it, you're stepping into we humans are special. We humans have strong souls. But that there are intelligences who look at us the way we look at a beautiful pasture full of cattle. Only in the metaphor, we are the cattle. If you're raising cattle, you keep them comfortable, you keep them well fed. They don't have any other context in which to look at the fences as anything except this is where they live. We can look at that same pasture, the same cattle, and we can see the fences as keeping them from being free. And maybe what the rest of the 21st century is going to be about is humanity beginning to understand what fences are fencing us in that we might not even have words for, but that it's really going to be important for us to understand more and more about what this universe is that we are in. And that phrase, who are the hostiles, who are the neutrals, who are the friendlies, and that our government for one, is acting, and I think there's some inside information, that there really is something that would be considered a threat. Well, coming back, and I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way, if those words are true and this is what is coming as a, some sort of a message, then get the headline out and completely give credibility to every human on this planet 
We are not alone in this universe. And no matter what you have been interacting with, <laughs> we don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. Ian, are you all right? Yeah, I, I am. The sign dropped out there. I don't know what went wrong, but you're back again now. Clear. It, 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 it sounded like a bit of an explosion. And I was at the end of my sentence and I thought, wow, I wonder if there is some effort uh, to uh, even keep us from uh, trying to discuss what could be a big potential uh, truth coming. Now, on the, on the positive side of things, no matter what all else is out there beyond, we're not alone in the universe. There's nothing in me that is afraid. There is nothing in me that makes me feel like we would ever choose to run when and if we are given the chance to know everything that the power brokers know and then join together in metaphorical hands and agape love with each other as homo sapien sapien that other beings in this complicated universe seem to think we are something special. We need to find out why we are special. We need to connect with our souls for real. And then maybe if there are adversaries or a threat, just, just the consciousness, consciousness of the truth might make a difference. That's my prayer every day, that the governments don't uh, keep condemning us to ignorance when what we need is all the facts and all the truth. So uh, thank you very much for that question. Are you there? Okay, Linda. <laughs> Linda, I have another question for you. Have any alien hybrid children ever been allowed to live on Earth with their human mother? Wow, that is a great question. I, there is a, this flash in my mind in which I am thinking of the interviews that I have done where people have been abducted, impregnated, a female uh, who, who knows that the pregnancy is taken from her um, just exactly like what we were uh, hearing uh, from Terry tonight, but that the mother ended up in a situation, if I'm recalling this correctly, where the Greys literally communicated that they, they needed her help, uh, like the man that Terry was talking about, and that in needing her help, I believe she was taken. I do not believe it happened in her house or on this earth. That's the part I'm not sure. Um, and that what I remember was in that particular one, I was face to face with this woman. And uh, she, she had accommodated to the fact that there was some reason why she would be impregnated and these beings would take the baby. And that when she was asked to help, as she was telling me, she began, her eyes began to glisten and she had the tears of what I call human compassion. That the child that was walked to her did not look human human, but that she felt this resonance as the woman who had given birth. And I remember, because I can't recall the details, I've uh, talked to so many people, I remember the large patterns. And that was one of those patterns where you want to embrace a human, a woman who would not be scared and, and all of those sort of things, but was feeling that tremendous compassion 
that this was something she had carried. It was now in another world, but she could still feel tears for the situation. And sometimes I wonder if these are moments of some kind of insight that whatever is going on at the biggest level, that the Betty Grays, will call them, there may be an existential crisis. We may face an existential crisis here on Earth with the climate and other unstable aspects of this planet. What would we do? Would we have some way to reach out to another civilization and straightforwardly ask for help? Maybe these gray and progenitor and AI, the whole strange mix, maybe they are at some weird existential crisis and we may be what is looked at as the bridge to get from whatever problem they've got to some other place. And maybe out of all of this, maybe we will be helped. But waiting in the wings are these warnings that I have gotten myself, that there is something that is considered to be a threat. And my answer always is, tell all of us everything you know about the threats so that we as humans can prepare ourselves, strengthen ourselves for whatever. To be blindsided, I think, is the worst. I think more knowledge and more truth, the stronger we get. And that's what I hope. And that the question, Ian, raises almost the biggest question of all, what is the relationship right now between 21st century Homo sapien sapien and all of the hybrid children that have been described by people who have been taken in abductions? If people are talking and speculating about the multiple generations in families, we've yeah. had people in the chat who are talking about their mothers and their grandmothers being involved in the same sort of program. Yeah, and the bloodline definitely is a key, but no one has explained successfully what exactly is the, the what are the various bloodlines to the non-humans. And if it does have to do with the original manipulation of DNA, how far back do we go? Homo sapien sapien, and this is really something I, I would love to hear from all of you out there who may or may not have insights about some of this whole issue of uh, genetic evolution, that you may have been exposed to things that I have not been. If, if we, this model is 45,000 years old, and we're learning more and more that Neanderthal before us, they had a larger brain capacity. Uh, now the new news that they uh, had what looks like evidence in the ears that they probably heard sounds and probably had made sounds. And we know that they put flowers on the graves of their dead because they, uh, where they have found the uh, skeletons and remains, there have been pollen from as if you would put flowers or wheat or something on the dead. They, they now know that some of the paintings in the caves along the French and uh, Spanish border were Neanderthal. So if the previous generation of humanoids created by extraterrestrials by manipulating DNA and already evolving primates were large, strong, big brain, compassion. Why were they cross-faded out and we were cross-faded in? And you can ask that about all of them going back to Denisovan and Homo erectus and that's only, Homo erectus only gets you back two million years. 
and we're on a 4.6 billion year old planet. How many different era eons of different extraterrestrial use of this big laboratory planet have there been? And that may be the key. And I don't know anybody who has answers to that big a question. But that might be a key to some bigger, huge farming project that is involving all the evolutionary threads all the way up to now and that the bloodlines of humanity have something to do with all of this that's happened in the past. And then would the greys, the specific, we're calling them the Betty greys as opposed to some of the others. We did, we did, us as a group will borrow Terry, uh, Terry's uh, uh, colleague, Betty. From their point of view, it may be that certain bloodlines, just like we would cultivate a crop over a long period of time, the way the vineyards of grapes are made for certain wines in France, that there may be something about the modifying process, the genetic manipulation process, that they are in the trying to come up with a new wine, so to speak, having to do with organic life that will interface with all of their AI and who are the progenitors of the gray artificial intelligent world. You assume they're organic, but if not, I mean, why would an artificial intelligence civilization be wanting to hybridize with the organics of something like Homo sapiens sapien. These are big haunting questions and they are going to be with us, I assume, for a long time. But I'm glad we're talking about it now because whatever is coming that is going to be defined for us and shown for us as a threat, I'm hoping that our Wednesday nights, that a lot of you will have been exposed to enough of the complexity of everything that we are involved in that whatever you hear, you can place it in some of this larger context and then, and then we'll see where the discussion goes. Okay, Ian, what about another? Okay, well, this goes to Terry finding himself outside taking photographs uh, of, of the moon. Now, Terry has already referenced there being an alien base on the moon and alien intelligences. People are speculating how many alien intelligences are on the moon and also do they have perhaps alien bases further inside the earth or maybe even at what's known as uh, aquatic aliens or underwater alien bases as well? The answer is yes to all of those. Uh, specifically, remember in uh, the program on February 10th that Terry talked uh, in great detail about going to the back side of the moon with Betty. She was there physically with him. And she was telling him that the moon is a machine. It was placed with great control, that the inside of the moon was dominated by the reptilian ETs, that the size of the machine of that the moon is was placed with that size precisely in the orbit that it has in order to cause humans to relate to this moon in terms of cycles without us knowing we were being monitored by ETs from inside the moon, based on the inside the moon and the backside, and that the monitoring from the moon has been there for a very long time. And on our Earth, I've talked about it many, many times, and the summary would be that the Defense Intelligence Agency analyst 
who met with me for seven hours in December of 1999 after working for a month through a man who worked for the World Bank to set up the meeting. In the first, I'll say first big hour, the whole thing was about the geophysical relationship of advanced intelligences that come to a planet like Earth that would have so much water, perceive it as a laboratory, but that they look at a planet or a moon like spherical geometry. And not all moons are spherical, but it's, it's a phrase I'm using that if you look at the Earth, they would look at this as a spherical geometry that has layers, has hidden areas, uh, and that he went into great detail about how there were three major competing, what he called extraterrestrial civilizations that were in conflict and competed with each other, reptilian, tall blondes that he referred to as Nordics, and the greys that were largely AI with organic components. And that those three were identified as having been in conflict over this planet for at least 270 million years. And when I asked him, he said, we have proof, our government has proof that these three groups have been competing over Earth for 270 million years. And when I said, what proof? That's when he said, it's too dangerous for you or for me, and would not say. But he went into great detail about how each of those groups preferred different parts inside of this planet. The greys like to be inside of mountains, the blondes like to go down through the bottoms of the oceans, and that there are big, big, we know this now, I mean, geophysicists know, there are huge, huge, huge spaces that are down way, way below. Like if you go down to the Mariana Trench, seven, eight miles, we're not talking about abyss. We're not talking about the movie or something where you would have uh, buildings, structures on the, on the sea floor. No, no, no. It's that you go through the bottoms of the basins of the seas and the oceans and the lakes, like Great Lakes. Then you get into structures that they would know already from their uh, access having to do with geophysical analysis, and, and the blondes know where they want to go inside the planet. Much safer inside the planet, much safer inside the mountains, and that the reptilians are supposed to demand or need warm temperatures. And that Mesopotamia is one of their lands. And Betty says they also control the interior of the moon. From everything I've been exposed to, this isn't uh, even speculation. That these are known, well-known facts um, we, that we knew a tremendous amount by the early 70s. And everything that has been gained since, I believe we have had collaboration with some certain non-humans, and they have been trying to help us uh, in perhaps not enthusiastic ways, but perhaps there's a quid pro quo. You give us X, we'll give you Y. And that might relate to the treaties like the one that was described uh, last uh, week when we were talking about uh, Eisenhower Treaty and, the, and Terry also, um, in which there was a treaty having to do with, you can take so many animals in the mutilations, you can take so many humans for, but you can't take more. That's the big box we're in. And sometimes I can understand why people in political and religious power would say humans can't handle this. And so they clamp down and have all these policies of lies and denial. I think humans can handle this. 
in fact, I think that if the power brokers don't take their hands off the neck of the world public and let us know all of the truth, good and bad, about what we are, what our souls are, what's in this universe with us, who are trying to help us, what is the biggest picture? I think unless we are told that, there really could be an existential crisis. If we are told all the truth, I think it will make everybody stronger and less likely for humans to kill each other. So that's the point of view I have. And I am open and welcome to any and all of you in the whistleblower category, military, government, intel, to provide me any information supporting or contradicting. But I do know for a fact we are in a revolutionary time. Something is going to be announced to us this year. The drumbeat that I have is it will be about threat. And it's nothing that there's nothing in me that feels like that we should move to fear. Just keep asking for knowledge. Just keep asking for truth. Asking for facts. Make yourself stronger. It's a revolutionary time. And I love you guys. I really, truly do. And I look forward to seeing you next week. And let's help get us up to at least close to 170,000 subscriptions for the party we will do here on the 24th of March, our spring equinox, all get together. And in the meantime, agape hug to you from me and you agape hug the whole world. Love you. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select a language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions them. will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>